happy to be here and to talk about my own thing, the uh, Henry Williams Love Foundation. Henry Williams was my daddy, and my father passed in May of 2017, which was an interesting time for me as a professional because it was right at the time that we at Smart Chicago decided that we were going to probably move into a merger situation. So my dad died, and now I'm trying to merge, and it was just like an interesting space. But from that, uh, my family and I decided that we wanted to honor my dad. He was a fantastic dude. He was a community dude. Um, he loved everybody. He would make lots of food and go up and down the road in Kankakee and deliver it to the seniors that uh, couldn't get out of their homes. So he had a, a big heart for community, and that's kind of where I think I got it, certainly. So, the Henry Williams Love Foundation, we are a uh, 501c3, founded in 2017. These are my brothers. I'm the only female child in my family, and clearly the best looking. <laughs> my older brother, Joseph, is a, a high school football coach. And my uh, younger brother, John, is a developer. He works for Verizon. And we do a lot of things in Henry Williams Love. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about our technology space, but uh, we do emergency services and unplanned loss. My father, here's an interesting fact, my father, um, his father passed when he was nine. His mother passed when he was 11. And it was seven of them. And so they never came into care. The neighbors all chipped in and kept them in their own home. So they would come over and trade times and spend the night with the kids. And so that, again, that sense of community fidelity is something that you know, was deeply rooted in him and he passed on to us. We also do uh, community advocacy. We do women in culinary arts. My grandmother was a fantastic chef before she passed away. We had a small restaurant in the Bellwood area. Uh, technology uptake and, and arts appreciation because art is healing and I believe that. So we have a problem here in the technology world. Just thought you should know <laughs> that uh, of the tech jobs and tech adjacent jobs, women only occupy 7% of that. And then black women like myself only occupy 3% and in other countries it's less than 1%. Uh, they estimate that 55,000 new jobs come on the market that touch on tech or are tech specific. And we want to know, where are the stories of the world? How many people in here saw the movie Black Panther? Not nearly enough hands. <laughs> I need everybody at the Shahak night to go on head and watch the Black Panther movie. I mean, if you are a comic book person, like, He's part of this story now, you know what I mean? Like he's in the Avengers and blah, 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 blah. So watch it. You said what? Perfect Netflix and chill movie. You know what I'm saying? Like have some, some Black Panther, talk about diversity and disparity. It's a good way to get it in, I'm telling you. <laughs> But outside of all of the things that we know about women in tech and black women in tech, there's some other things happening, especially in the black community. Uh, so the APA defines trauma as an emotional response to a terrible event like an accident or rape or a natural disaster. So we have common traumas, and all of us in here have experienced some level of trauma. But in lower socioeconomic communities, black and brown specifically, there seems to be a disproportionate amount of traumas. And for these young ladies that were in my program, the Shuri Project, we heard these stories. Victims of sexual abuse. And these girls are eight to 12, by the way, in the Roseland community, far south side. Witness domestic violence, being placed in the foster care or juvenile system, seeing your cousin get shot in front of your house, watching your mother overdose on the living room floor, watching your father suffer from a chronic mental illness, and seeing the repeated media coverage and social media coverage of black people getting shot by the police. 
So then you add race to that, and then all the other isms to that, and you have a pretty confused and oftentimes undiagnosed, depressed young lady or young man. So what happens to this, the girls, like when they face all of these this complexities? And let's be honest, like I'm a clinician by, by trade and a, a technician by passion. So there's lots of folks that work with children that don't have that duality. So when you're bringing these children into your programs and into services and you don't understand like human behavior and you know clinical issues and how that impacts with trauma we are doing these programs and wondering why nothing is changing in these communities it's a question that I ask myself all the time so we created this thing because I watched the, the Black Panther movie like five times, right? <laughs> and it, not just because it was you know, a good movie, because it was, but I was so fascinated by the character Shuri. Shuri is Black Panther's sister, and she ran the tech and engineering lab in Wakanda, the pretend land where everything was all right. And uh, she was so, energetic and articulate and she was funny and she was smart and all of these cool little inventions and it really spoke to who I am and who I was as a little girl because my father was one that pushed tech in our household. So I had the speak and read, the speak and spell, the speak and math, the speaks and whatever. I had all of the computer equipment. My father you know, worked um, as an engineer himself, so we had access to things that weren't even on the market yet. Uh, he also was a maker, a tinkerer, so I learned how to like, you know, make airplane propellers and all type of, you know, I had a weird child, it was, it was fun though. So we, we learned all these things and, and Shuri reminded me of myself. So we created this project called the Shuri Project. I had the absolute pleasure and advantage of working at Smart Chicago where we created a project called Youth Led Tech. So we had some experience running youth programs and uh, this technology mentoring program. So I wanted to take kind of a specific look at how we can impact girls. Because in the youth led tech program we did boys and girls, but certainly there was always these moments where we had to separate the two because the girls and the boys had very different issues and we felt like we needed to do something really specific for girls, especially because of all the disparity and disproportionate opportunities that exist for them. So what is the Shuri Project? It's a program that I created. Uh, it has four major goals, to improve communication and interpersonal skills, to improve general and digital literacy and increase technical aptitude, to increase workforce development skills and exposure to tech careers, and to keep girls safe while improving their overall health. And that's a lot to do in six weeks, but we were pretty successful in doing it. So the Shuri Project, has a, a curriculum uh, that is very organic. So there's some baseline things that we do and then there's some youth-led things that we do. But all in all, at the end of the six-week summer program, all of the participants receive 10 hours of art, 15 hours in tech career workshops, 20 hours of recreation, 30 hours of nutrition time, so that's meals and education, and 140 hours of actual tech instructional time. Now, you've probably heard of lots of mentoring or tech skill programs. There's a lot, you know, they've popped up all over Chicago. You know, you too can be a coder, you know. Uh, and so we did not want to brand ourselves or present ourselves as a coding program. Because yes, we did dabble a little bit in coding, but we dabbled a little bit in everything. But what made our program, I think, most important is this emphasis on the person. 
So it was not just about drilling down into this skill building moment for them, but drilling down to who they were in this moment as little eight-year-old and 12-year-old girls. And so as important as we pushed the skills for them to learn that stuff, we did so much work around character development. And in doing that work, it was important that who was instructing or mentoring understood where these little girls were coming from. Now, I stood in front of the girls with my Shurri Project t-shirt on. That first day, I was ready, I was excited, and they all were looking at me and asked me, is Shuri coming to this camp? <laughs> And I said, well, not exactly like the inner Shuri, you know, we're going to speak to. And they were like, mm, OK. If we can't get Shuri, Cardi B. Is Cardi B available? <laughs> and so it's important, as we continue our journey of education that we're, with children, that we're able to connect with them. So of course, I was able to turn the Cardi B, the Nicki Minaj's, the Drake's, and all of the things that are kind of centric to their current mind state into educational lessons and that touch tech and some of them that were very specific to tech. So we had this pedagogy that we uh, coined that we were calling like the black girl experience. Because I was a little black girl once, and when I was a little black girl, despite living in a pretty, you know, middle class black neighborhood, I wasn't light skinned, so I got teased a lot for having darker complexion skin. My father was very, very dark skinned, and so he got teased by the kids on the block for his color and complexion. Uh, we uh, got teased about our hair, if your hair wasn't curly, if it was too high, if it you know, was straight. Uh, you got teased if uh, your socioeconomic status wasn't appropriate. Uh, we had family members that were involved in crime and gangs and all of these things that we talked about on the trauma uh, slide. I had experienced that. And if you had not experienced that, and you go before children who, although they are eight, are far, far more mature because of their life experiences. Talking about what we're going to learn today is Ruby on Rails is probably not going to work out so well for you. So the black girl experience was uh, an intentional instructional design for the Shuri Project. We hired black and brown women to teach the classes. When we did have male speakers come in, Derek uh, graced us to talk about hacking, we had to do a lot of pre-teaching to the young ladies to say, don't beat up little Derek, okay? He is giving, <laughs> he is giving up his heart. He from Shy Hack Night, look it up on the internet. He is famous in these civic technology streets. <laughs> Love him, please, children, okay, all right. So, it was important that we had women that were standing before them that could speak to them, that could show them, that could use their own life experiences to, to tell them how they got over. Because representation is key. The one thing about black children and brown children in these neighborhoods, and you're, you're asking the question like, you know, there's so much opportunity. You can go to all these programs for free. I never had these programs for free when I was growing up. Like, why isn't things changing? That's because they don't believe that it can change. Because the people that are talking to them about it being possible don't look like them. And they don't act like them, and they don't eat the same things that they eat, and they don't live where they live. So when you have people coming into your neighborhood telling you you can be everything that you want to be, baby girl, and you don't really understand the depths of the trauma, you don't understand how you are sitting in a classroom and you're looking during your geeking out time and you're looking at a scroll, a news feed, where our current president says something that makes you feel like you don't matter, 
that being a black girl in Chicago doesn't matter, then to hell with Ruby on Rails, Python, R, and everything else. Because if you feel like you don't matter, then nothing that you do actually is going to matter. And then what happens is you fall into these careers as a matter of necessity, not as a matter of choice. And we wanted to provide these young ladies with choice using the black girl experience as a way to kind of weave through all of the muck. She's so cute, I like her hair, it's kind of like mine, but mine has got a whole lot more gray in it, my child. <laughs> so this is my, these are my girls, the Shuri Project. We transformed a sanctuary of a church into a learning experience. We were uh, so graciously, um, accepted into the New Life uh, Baptist Church in the Roseland community. They opened up their sanctuary and, and their entire building uh, so that our girls could actually learn. So uh, between the ages of eight and 12, uh, she is our youngest at eight and she was our oldest at uh, 12. And all of them completed the program. And similarly to what we did at UFLED Tech, we kept that going because a motivating factor for participation, I mean, for as much as y'all like coming here to the Shy Hack Night, some of y'all is up in here for opportunity, right? You are coming for the opportunity. They too need to show up for some opportunity. So we made sure that they had something to earn. So we were able to do some crowdsource fundraising, thank you to all my supporters, and got computers for the young ladies. So they learned on laptops, they were able to earn those laptops if they completed all of their learning objectives. One of the most important portions of this program is about public speaking. As evident by me standing up here, I don't have no problem with that. <laughs> But most of them do because when you carry yourself small because you live in a world that makes you feel like you don't matter, then you don't ever want to share your voice. So on the first day when we told them that we do a demo day and they were going to have to publicly present these websites that they were building, oh my goodness, at least four of them said they wanted to call their mama because it wasn't, it wasn't going down. It was like, I'm not doing it. One young lady said to me, the last time I publicly spoke, I had an anxiety attack and I passed out. You don't want that on your hands, do you? I said, girl, I used to be a nurse's aide in church. I know all about the passing out. I got you. You're going to be all right. So we had these expectations and we pushed them towards these expe expectations because we know in order to get a job, you got to be able to talk about yourself. And you wonder why a lot of people are not able to not only obtain a job or sustain a job, it's because they don't have the confidence to represent themselves well. So we wanted to plant that seed early for them. We had some outcomes. So I will have a full impact uh, report available on our website, henrywilliamslove.org, at the end of this month. But in time for Shy Hack Night, because I am a statistician, I was able to pull a couple stats together. We had, did a survey, and there's a lot of other program evaluative methodologies that we instituted in the Shuri Project, but we had a 100% increase in web development skills from all the participants. A 40% increase in general literacy skills, meaning there were young ladies who started our program that had some reading comprehension problems and through our curriculum and our instructional time, we were able to push them up and bump them up. We had a 70% increase in digital literacy skills, a 90% increase in exposure to tech and STEM careers. A big portion and a big problem about STEM is that you don't really know what you can do, especially when you don't know anybody who's done the things that you don't think you can do because you don't really know about it. So we were very intentional on bringing people in and talking about what they did for a living and how they got to what they did for a living, which was very helpful for our young ladies. 97% increase in self-esteem and self-image. 
One of the questions on the survey was, describe yourself. And no one described themselves as beautiful, um, articulate, smart, um, sharing, giving. All of their descriptors about themselves were midline, if not negative, all the way. 97% increase in communication skills, especially public speaking. We talked about that. 82% interest in learning more about tech. A lot of them came because their mama said they had to. But at the end, they were like, what are we going to do next? 64% increase in interest to, oh, uh, to learn more about STEM. So historically, we hear, especially around with, with, with girls, I hate science. I hate math, but we were able to introduce and explore all of STEM, which had a lot of them saying, well, wh like, what do you need to do to be an engineer? When on day one, they were like, mm -mm, I want to be a dancer. <gasps> I hope that was contemporary dance, you know. <laughs> A uh, 30% decrease in anxiety. Now, they couldn't say anything positive about themselves, but they all were able to identify that they had anxiety. I didn't even know how to spell anxiety until like yesterday. So the, pro the fact that they know that, and it's not being addressed, but they identify that way, is something that we need to talk about. And we had some decre decreases in disruptive behavior. And that is now post the program. So we had some young ladies that, you know, self-reported that they cut up in school. And since school has started, parents have called and said, totally different child. They see something in themselves. They're carrying themselves differently. They're evangelizing their little friends in the classroom who are too cutting up which shows that we've planted some seeds. What is our plan? Because I always got a plan, ask Derek. I got like seven of them in my pocket all, at all times. Uh, we are going to expand the Surety Project to five communities by next June. That is our plan. That is what we're speaking into the universe. So anybody here just happened to be holding on to some additional funding that you just want to share with me, I am available to receive it. I am a 501c3, C slide two. Um, for every community in Chicago we expand to, we want to identify a sister city because in our outcomes, or I'm sorry, in our uh, problem slide, we identify that less than 1% of women internationally are in STEM and in tech. Uh, and so this program has a brother T'Challa, that is the Black Panther's legal name. <laughs> I wonder, does he have to do a DBA, doing business as Black Panther? I don't know. Cook County, we got to talk about it. Um, so that's for the boys. And then we have the Wakanda Tech Project, which is for everybody. You know what I'm saying? And that's boys, girls, families, you know what I'm saying? Because in our program, we are open, like open source. Open discussion, open instruction, come and sit in here if you want some of this, because we know that people need some of these skills. So we are going to be expanding that internationally, and we have a board presentation in Africa in November. And if it goes well, we will see the Sheree Project in Africa in the summer. So I'm excited about that. And we're going to try to expand to three additional U.S. cities by the end of next year. Uh, so we're also working very hard and have some opportunity areas um, identified. The one thing that I wanted to drill down um, in, as we talk about representation being key uh, is not to say that other folks that aren't African American, black, or however you want to describe us, uh, can't teach tech to black kids. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that in order for it to stick, in order for it to be impactful, and in, in order for it to mean something, you need to ensure that there's some representation, because without it, I believe that you're going to lose 
all of the work, all of the resources, all of the things that you hope to happen, I don't think that it will have as much staying power. And there are plenty of people in the city of Chicago that do tech work and do STEM work. I was just at a networking thing on Sunday with the sisters in STEM, so there was a room full, you know, 50 plus women who work in STEM. I think that we need to do a better job about networking and utilizing our resources. And for as much as we want, you know, uh, the tech equity to improve, for as much as we want people to be highly technically skilled, we can't do that unless we work better together. And so, if you are connected to a black or brown community, because I'm both, uh, and need someone to assist, I am here to help with your representation concerns because representation is key. And if you want to contact me, here's all my information. This is one of my little babies, Olivia. Olivia um, was a fantastic eight-year-old and she's putting up her Wakanda forever. Uh, the Shuri Project was chosen to present a workshop at WakandaCon 2018. So not only did my young ladies uh, get all of this learning, they also can add conference presenters to their resume because they did the workshop. I, I just kind of sat back and let them do their thing and it was beautiful. So um, that is my presentation. Uh, representation is key. And I'll take questions now. Uh, fantastic presentation. Thank Absolutely you. wonderful. Uh, for your uh, education, your educators that are implementing the pedagogy, are you mostly doing that, like staffing and paying for uh, folks to come in, or are you getting mostly volunteers? How does that work? Uh, it's a mixture of, of both. So we um, did, our instructors were contractors, and we did three trainings with them to ensure that they understood the model and understood the purpose, and were able to co-create uh, even additional things uh, to add to our curriculum to make it even more kind of like uh, specific and culturally appropriate. And then all of our speakers, um, Derek included, were all volunteers, and we had uh, probably 50 different uh, speakers come throughout the time uh, that we were there, uh, including uh, we, we wrote a song. So on one of the days, uh, this was the session that I taught, I consider myself a volunteer because baby, I'm working for free, but it's important work. Um, I taught them how to set up and wire a room for a presentation. So mics, projectors, and you know, everything that happens here, we taught them how to do that. We then wrote a song and went to recording studio and recorded the song. That was all one day. This is a very intensive program. So when people say, oh, my kid's not ready, is he moving too fast? No, if you are coming in the Shuri Project, we are going to help you understand how important it is for you to get all of these things in this short period of time. And then our follow-up game, you know, we're disrupting follow-up. Like follow-up is normally like, oh, you know, you did it, great. We write a report, great. We're gonna try to do it again, great. No, we are in constant contact with these young ladies and we'll be following them until high school to see what happens. Do they choose a technical high school? Uh, do they get into more STEM programming? All those types of things to see how we need to make adjustments. Uh, what other neighborhoods are you planning um, on expanding into? So we are looking um, for, so we're in Roseland now. Uh, we are looking for uh, North Lawndale, Austin. Like we were trying to hit that west side um, well. Inglewood is doing pretty good. There's been a lot of resources that have been poured into the Inglewood area. But there's like um, some gaps like in Washington Park. The park sits in the middle, but everything on the outside of it is kind of suffering. So we have a couple of uh, different neighborhoods. We actually have a waiting list of 20 uh, neighborhoods and schools that are, want us to come and do the program because this model is a summer model but it's totally portable and expandable so it also can be an eight month after school program too so we are trying our best to you know raise revenue so that we'll be able to do what we need to do this is a very lean running program and we designed it as such because we didn't want that to be a barrier for the educational opportunity 
What does a typical plus lesson plan look like and how do you incorporate the pop culture figures you mentioned into the lesson? So a typical lesson, um, it, it looks very similar to like, you know, a regular elementary school lesson. We do uh, lots of uh, warm up, warm ups, uh, temperature checks. We do lots of peace circles because how you get your best information is when you create an environment for them to share without being penalized. So one day, because you know I was the supply runner, I had to bring in some supplies, you know, fruit snacks, gummy bears, you know, all that type of stuff. They were in the middle of one of their peace circles. In the peace circle, only the people who have participated in the peace circle and gave the word that they would not break the peace circle is allowed. They wouldn't even let me in the program to drop off the snacks because I had not agreed to keep the secrets of the peace circle. That's how important it was and I respected that because that is how the girls felt comfortable to share. And by bringing in the, the pop, cultural, uh, pop culture references, we would use that for the tech assignments. So we would say, hey, go out and look at three of your favorite artists' websites and do a website critique on it from a child's perspective. So they would talk about language, they would talk about flow, they would talk about colors, they would talk about it being outdated, like Drake got 15 albums, but only eight of them is up here. You know, so like helping them to critically think about web products in a way, but using something that was going to hold their attention. The other thing that we allowed them to do, which doesn't happen in a lot of spaces, is we allow them to play music. So music, not just in their headphones, but sharing the music because it, music, as I said earlier, art is pretty healing. So we were able to have the girls learn a little bit more about other types of music by the girls kind of sharing what they were into, what they were listening to. What did the 10 hours of art look like? So the 10 hour arts, it, it was everything, oh my goodness. So uh, we uh, made uh, paper mache uh, heads because a lot of the girls, you know, they are about the weave life and you need somewhere to lay your weave when you take it out. I mean, this is a cultural thing, right, okay? So we made paper mache heads so for the weaves that was a pretty interesting project one of the young girls had saw it on pinterest and said we had to do it uh, we did painting uh, we did um, a unicorn skirt that was kind of cute i got one it was a little short for me to wear tonight i didn't want to be on the <laughs> camera with my unicorn skirt on um, so uh, lots of singing, we did uh, all types of dancing. Um, so we uh, explored art along the continuum and a lot, again, this is a youth-led, co-created curriculum. So things that they wanted to do, we are called, we do rapid curriculum planning. So if you said it, then we would go right into putting that into place and we get it on the schedule for that week. And that helps for the youth to stay engaged because then they, start to trust that what you say you're going to do is what you're doing and that's helpful in changing the mind having a paradigm shift in well maybe this is for me maybe this can happen for me what's the next step for girls to finish the program and where do you point them for further learning opportunities and i think you talked about yeah, so the SURE project is actually a four-part project. So this summer was just the T in STEM. We have a science curriculum, an engineering curriculum, and a math curriculum. So what we're trying to do is pace the program in different communities and starting with different portions of STEM and every girl that takes the technology part now can either get in the science part or the engineering part or the math part. So we're trying to coordinate that in the way. We'll be back in Roseland for the summertime. So we'll be doing another section of the technology, but adding one of the STEMs uh, uh, to, to that curriculum opportunity. So those same girls, if they want to, can enroll in that. The other thing is, is that we're keeping them connected. They are on Slack too. And um, we pass along resources to them and to their parents. 
So if they are aware, um, you know, Hive is a good resource for things that are happening, and we, tr we are uh, very community oriented, so we're trying to make sure that we either identify things in their community that they can get to easily, if not, then that helps us to decide what to do next. Because what we've endeavored to do, and I shared this with Derek, is that we're not gonna be the group that you know, uh, recreates the will. We're trying to fill gaps innovatively so that people can still get the services that they need even if there's an existing service that they weren't either interested in or couldn't get into for whatever reason. So we're trying not to be duplicative. We're trying to really be gap fillers in our own unique way. Are you going to look at different Yes. So on, 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 on the first day of orientation, we have a mandatory orientation for parents or guardians on the first day because, again, like, it's, and it's always been amazing to me that people will drop their kids off and they don't know who they're dropping them off to. So I'm like, oh, no, you're going to come in here and meet me because we ain't going to have no problems. We're going to make some face-to-face -face contact. The first day, a young lady rolled in late. She was a younger mom. She rolled in late with her kid and a five-year-old. And so we're talking. We're doing the orientation. We're showing all the things that we're going to be doing. The five-year-old five -year busts out crying. I'm like, oh my God, what is wrong with this baby? You know, and I come from the, uh, the school of if the baby cry, I just give him a piece of peppermint or something, you know, hopefully that'll distract him long enough. So I'm, you know, I'm like, are you okay, little baby? And she was like, why I can't be in the Shuri Project? I can read, I know how to read. So I was like, oh my God. And, and so it, you know, it helped me to understand that we need to expand. The other thing that I want to point out is that the curriculum that we wrote is actually for older children. So we were pushing the envelope to see if we could get the eight to 12 year olds to actually learn this curriculum that really is kind of more 12 to 17. And they did it because we were intensive, we were intentional, and they were focused. And so I believe with a couple of tweaks, we can get the five year old. I think we can do it. So as uh, someone who went to school with a lot of uh, my peers who had white-collar parents and was to work with them growing up, um, I didn't have that experience. And I imagine a lot of uh, your girls also have a similar experience mm -hmm. where they, they don't have like a take your kids to work day with a parent that works at like, a tech job. Um, what kind of opportunities do you see uh, for um, introducing that kind of element where they get exposure to um, like either a startup space or like some tech company, um, and as someone who works at a startup slash tech company, I think that we be more willing to like partner and share a lot of other business needs. Absolutely, thank you so much for that commitment. We took them. We had CLK uh, Engineering, uh, which is a uh, black woman engineering firm. Uh, she's a civil engineer. She's done a couple of roads and buildings in the city. And we did a tour. She took them on a tour and, you know, showed them all the things. And the, the young lady said, we didn't even know that we could do this. Because every time we see construction people, they're men. And we didn't know that women were allowed to be construction people or civil engineers from a technical perspective. So we took them to Odyssey Fun World and they had to do engineering and physics while they were there. That was hilarious, trying to figure out how the go-karts go. You know, so we took them outside of our church environment, which was our learning um, launch pad and took them to different places. But we definitely are looking for more, even more people that we can take them to and kind of, you know, do this day in the life. Because that, the exposure for, again, for as much as we taught them tech and stuff, for as much as we did the mentoring and the black girl experience, that exposure piece, like that's the third piece. Like they have to know that there's something else beyond even this moment that we've introduced them to. Hi. Um, so first of all, this is an amazing program. I'm just so impressed with how to, at how ambitious you are and how much you've accomplished. Um, so yeah. Um, so how do you how do you deal with mul like multiple applicate? How do you pick these girls? How do you deal with girls who might not have the financial ability to pay for a program like this? It's free. 
100% free. We feed them breakfast and lunch every day, 100% free. Nothing comes out of pocket. They get a cute little t-shirt like this, and all free. And how do they, how do you, so let's say 100 girls apply, how do you pick? We had 127 that applied uh, for Roseland. We only could, could take in um, the 15 that we took in. We took in 20, but we knew that we weren't gonna be able to retain 20 because this is a working program, like you gotta do stuff. And we knew that there was gonna be some girls who was like, wait a minute, we're not gonna be just dancing every day? You know, and they needed to, you know, move, move along. Uh, and hopefully we can get them back, because you know, the community talks. So people are like, wait, they got computers, and you know, all that's happening, right? But we did first come, first serve. Um, we didn't want to do like the lottery system or anything like that. We wanted this first time to be as, as organic as possible. My job as uh, the president of this organization and the creator of this program is that we have enough opportunity that we don't have to turn anybody away. Because through natural attrition, folks are gonna weed themselves out. You know, there's lots of things happening during the summertime here in Chicago. So you may have thought you wanted to do Shuri, but ended up doing music camp or something like that. Uh, but we wanna make sure that at least the opportunity is there. Uh, so 15 is a good magical number. We thought 20 was the number, 15 really is it, because I don't know if you've ever had 15, eight to 12 year olds. <laughs> That's why I'm all gray. I wasn't even this gray when I started in May. It was like I had a little bit, and I was like, shh, super gray. So 